Our next talk up is going to be one of our short talks from the selected from the poster abstracts. And this was actually, a, I was particularly excited about this choice because this is a very long time JGI collaboration with a scientist named Wen So Lu on this a reactor degrading terephthalate, which we first started studying, I think, back in 2008 or something, when we, all we could do was Sanger sequencing. And back at that time, we got some really interesting insights into this community, but we couldn't really go to the depth that we wanted to to really characterize this. And with the new technologies, they've revisited it and really it told a fascinating story about the multi-party interactions that are happening in this environment. And so Masaru Nobu, a grad student in the lab, is going to be telling us about his work on this system. Thanks. Thank you. Great. So. With all this new technology, single cell genomics, we've been getting such amazing insight into all these candidate phyla. And I'd like to introduce some progress that we've made, some amazing progress we've made in understanding the ecological roles of these organisms in methanogenic environments. And we used a methanogenic bioreactor as a model ecosystem to study these organisms. So just to introduce methanogenic eco ecosystems, you have about four simple trophic groups. You have depolymerizers, fermenters, syntrophs, and methanogens interacting to degrade macromolecules down to methane. And the reason this is interesting is because, one, it's an important component of the global carbon cycle, groundwater, sediments, soils, even engineered systems, so bioremediation and wastewater treatment. Methane, methanogenesis is a very important component of all of these. And it's interesting because methane that is produced from this process is a great energy source as well. So we wanted to understand, there's a threefold interest in understanding the ecology behind methanogenesis. So this is a 16S based, uh, 16S ribosomal RNA based phylogenetic tree that you're all familiar with, just radial form. And what I have highlighted here is our candidate phyla, so uncultured phyla that are associated with methan methanogenic environments. And there are also many phyla with cultivated representatives that have many uncultured um, clades in them that we have no genetic or no physiological insight into. So our interest is both looking at these hi uh, phyla highlighted in red and clades highlighted in green as well. So we invested a methanogenic bioreactor degrading terephthalate. So what is terephthalate? Terephthalate is a compound that is generated as a byproduct of plastics production. So polyethylene terephthalate PET bottles. So the plastic that's used for making the plastic bottles for water bottles. And it's copiously dis discharged as waste. So in this system, it's very simple. You have two different types of organisms, two trophic groups, a syntroph degrading terephthalate down to hydrogen acetate, and methanogens degrading it down, degrading those down to methane and CO2. And like Susanna mentioned, in our past study, we we're we were interested in looking at what else is in the ecosystem, what else is happening besides these two trophic groups, because there's clearly more organisms involved in the process. But we really couldn't get at the deep um, understanding because we didn't have such nice technology back then. So to go back to the phylogenetic tree, what I have highlighted here are the phyla, or the taxonomic groups, that we find in the terephthalate degrading reactor. And you can see that we have a very nice broad coverage of all these phylogenetic groups that we're interested in that are associated with methanogenic environments. So I'm going to step back a little bit and explain what's happening in the terephthalate degrading reactor. So a syntroph is what we call the organism that degrades terephthalate down to hydrogen and acetate. What's interesting about these organisms is that their degradation is thermodynamically limited. So you have to look at the Gibbs free energy equation. So a vertical axis is delta G, horizontal axis is hydrogen. The general idea is that as byproducts accumulate, the thermodynamics get harder to push. So the reaction becomes endergonic. So this negative 20 is a good um, threshold to use. And the idea is that the product so in this case, hydrogen needs to be at a low enough concentration that the delta G is less than negative 20. In the case for terephthalate, when terephthalate is at 10 millimolar concentration, byproduct hydrogen needs to be at 200 nanomolar. Did I say that right? 10 millimolar and 200 nanomolar. That's a five orders of magnitude difference. And of course, you can't achieve this by yourself. If you degrade a little bit of terephthalate, you're going to generate sufficient hydrogen to inhibit your metabolism. So what they do is they make these obligate interactions with methanogens who 
take down hydrogen and acetate down to low enough concentrations and convert to methane. So this interaction is called syntrophy, where a syntroph is passing on substrates to methanogens, and in turn, methanogens is making this thermodynamically favorable environment. So in this energy-restricted environment, why are we seeing so many different organisms? What are they doing? So right now, the, um, the current theme that I'm explaining is that terephthalate is catabolically degraded to hydrogen and acetate. And that is degraded down to methane by methanogens. Now, there could be other compounds that are generated from terephthalate catabolism that we're overlooking, which we got insight into from our previous study. So classically, in syntrophy, you only think of methanogens degrading hydrogen and acetate, methanogens being the only supporter for syntrophs under methanogenic conditions. But that might not be true. We might see that there's hydrogen or acetate or butyrate degrading organisms supporting the syntrophic terephthalate degradation. And another component of metabolism that we always forget about, and especially in wastewater treatment, is carbon isn't just flowing through terephthalate through catabolism to methane. It's also going through anabolism. So through anabolism, ter terephthalate carbon is converted to biomass. And for example, that includes protein, lipids, carbohydrates. And those become a reservoir of reduced organic carbon available in the environment as detritus, as we would call ecologically. And that's a completely unaddressed energy source in the environment and also or in methanogenic environments. And, but it's important to understand because we need to understand how the entire flow of carbon from terephthalate is flowing to methane. So our hypothesis is that these uncultivated organisms are involved in processes converting the compounds in the middle row down to substrates and methanogens, methanogens can further convert to methane. So to go over the workflow that we went through, so the target ecosystem is this nice, beautiful TA reactor ecosystem. And we went through and sequenced 32 single, uh, single amplified genomes. And we complemented that with parallel shotgun sequencing of a metagenome and metatranscriptome. And processing them together through phylogenetic binning, we generated 34 draft genomes and six pan genomes spanning 23 genera and 15 phyla in this ecosystem. And based on our crude calculations, we've covered about 90% of the bacterial community. And this is unheard of for a wastewater treatment process and even in other methanogenic ecosystems. And just to show how that we're very confident in our binning. So we're very confident that we generated very high quality draft genomes for these organisms. And this is just a PCA representation of the results. So the horizontal axes are uh, from results from a principal component analysis and PC1 and PC2, and the vertical axis is read coverage from the metagenome. And you see that by color, you can see there's really nice clusters that are very distinct. Um, that involved a lot of manual curation and a lot of work over the past year. So we analyzed these genomes, these draft genomes that we generated from binning and single cell geno genomics, and tried to get at what's actually happening inside the terephthalate degrading reactor. So going back to this figure, we first figured out that there's these organisms from chloroflexi, thermotogai, and centrophaceae helping pelotomaculum centrophahabitas who are degrading terephthalate and helping them degrade hydrogen acetate butyrate, the byproducts from terephthalate degradation, and centrophically degrading that down to methan methanogen utilizable substrates. So that's something we completely missed in our previous study. And it's also, this is the first evidence, strong evidence for syntrophs interacting together to accomplish degradation of one substrate. So the one substrate is terephthalate, and we have three syntrophs, four syntrophs interacting together to degrade one substrate in this ecosystem. And in parallel to that, so looking at the anabolic byproduct side, so protein and lipids, for example, so we found many candidate phyla, so SAR-406, Cardioseca is no longer a candidate phylum, but what used to be known as OP5 and NKB19 and planktomyces members involved in helping degrade these macromolecules, protein lipids, hydrolyzing them and degrading them down to methanogen utilizable substrates like hydrogen and acetate. But it's not, that's not the end of the story. We find that these pathways are incomplete. They stop at generating branch chain fatty acids, for example, 
and we see that there are other organisms degrading these branch chain fatty acids syntrophically. And further, we see that generating propionate, and we see other candidate phyla, WW1 and OP9, involved in degrading propionate down further. So then we have these at least five different organisms, five different populations interacting together to, to degrade pro, just protein. And there's this nice chaining syntrophic interactions that facilitates that. And what's really interesting is that we term these organisms scavengers. It seems pretty logical, I think. And these organisms, because they're scavenging biomass, they're scavenging detritus, you can imagine that these organisms would be a common, or this ecological niche would be common between different methanogenic environments, whether it's a wastewater treatment facility or it's a groundwater or soil environment. And these organisms we very commonly find across these ecosystems, unlike these organisms on the left-hand side, Centrophaceae, Thermotoga, and Chloroflexi. So we hypothesize that these may support, these clades may support meth methanogenesis ubiqu ubiquitously. Of course, we're gonna to need to go into investigating this further, but it's a very interesting hypothesis for what these candidate phyla may be involved in doing in the methanogenic environments. So what I have shown here, this slide was very simplified. So to draw all the syntrophic interactions that we found, it's so what we knew from before. Pelotomaculum interacting with methanogens syntrophically. But we found out, of course, that there's different syntrophs supporting pelotomaculum TA degradation, terephthalate degradation. And then we found all these other candidate phyla interacting together at the metabolic level to support syntrophic degradation of very, very, very simple substrates. And not only this, is this interesting from an anaerobic metabolism perspective, but it's also the idea that going back to the big picture, these are candidate phyla. These are uncultured organisms. And when you think about it, these organisms, they're clearly dependent on interactions between organisms. And this is almost one of the most uh, ultimate, one of the ultimate microbial interactions where it's thermodynamic. It's an obligate interaction. And clearly they're interdependent. And this may be why these organisms were uncultured from methanogenic environments. But this doesn't stop us from trying to culture them. We, have, we now have insight into what kind of substrates they're degrading together. So in this case, we have terephthalate as a whole, but what if we narrow down to amino acids? What if we narrow down to branched chain fatty acids? We might not be able to isolate these syntrophs because by definition, they're organisms that depend on growth with other organisms but we could isolate them as a community, as a consortium degrading a particular compound to better understand their behavior. So currently we are trying to investigate the syntrophic and co-metabolic capabilities of these organisms, um, these candidate phyla using the results from the previous efforts um, on the microbial dark matter investigation. Thank you, that's it. Oh yeah, and acknowledgments, sorry. <laughs> uh, I thank the DOE, JGI, uh, UIUC, my home institution, Illinois, and uh, institution in Japan called the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology. All right, I think we have time for a couple questions, if anyone has any. All right, yeah, Laura, can we get it? We get, Mar uh, Miranda's got a microphone for you there. Okay. Hi, I'm curious as to your perspective on the presence of the scavengers and whether or not their metabolisms are more versatile than just feeding into the methanogenic cycle. Because um, it looks like you have sufficient hydrogen sink with your other organisms that that isn't necessarily why they're present in the community. They may just be opportunistic. Um, so if I understand your question correctly. Oh. oh. So you're asking about the hydrogen sink? And could you repeat your question about that No, I'm that saying part? it looks like you have sufficient hydrogen sink in the mm -hmm. absence of your scavenger population. Right. Um, and so I'm asking oh, it, what their, like how versatile their metabolism is and if it's necessary to believe that there are 
there because of methanogenesis or if they're there because these other substrates exist. Right. So these scavengers, they need the methanogens to grow. But like I think you're alluding to, the left side of the community doesn't require these scavengers. The scavengers can, don't need to be there necessarily for just the catabolic degradation of terra phthalate. What's really interesting, though, is that, so going back to the, this here, the organisms on this side for helping degrading terra phthalate down, so the Centrophysea and Thermotoga, the ones in the blue and green, or blue and orange, they're also getting substrates from other organisms involved in degrading the detritus. So our hypothesis is that they're not just helping the TA degradation directly, but they're also involved in directly in degradation of this detritus. So by having different sources of um, substrates and different sinks for their byproducts, they're actually quite intertwined. So um, this is actually great evidence for an observation that we always make with Centrophy where Classically, when we do syntrophic research, we culture the syntroph with a methanogen, a very, just a binary system, because one, it's very hard to grow these organisms and it's very difficult to study them. But we've isolated the pelodomaculum and methanogens. We grow, when we grow them, they take months to degrade terra phthalate. But clearly, by having all these other organisms in the ecosystem, they're removing 99% of the terra phthalate at a rapid rate and generating tons of methane. So, Yes, they do seem like it's almost an opportunistic niche, but we're trying to figure out how they're actually helping out with the terra phthalate degradation indirectly. Thanks. Yep. All right, well, thanks so much. Let's give a round of applause for Masaru.